My first paid writing assignment was a column for the Southwest Journal. I wrote the editor saying, there are a lot of kids in Southwest Minneapolis and you don't have anything written by a child. So I'm that child. And he didn't write back, which I took great offense to. So I wrote a aggressive follow-up letter. And he replied and said, I'm so sorry, I was on vacation. <laughs> knew that I wanted to be a writer. I learned how to read really young. Immediately I wanted to make the things that I was reading. I come from a pretty creative family. My uncle was an author. My father was a writer who ended up writing infomercials. Uh, so infomercial king of, of the Midwest is what I've crowned him. One of my earliest memories is driving with my dad and holding a notebook in my lap and him giving me prompts. I want you to write a short story and it has to have a character with this name and this name. And aside from my father, the biggest fan of my writing and the most encouraging force in my life for my writing was Aaron. October 2010, I wrote a lot on the internet about when I started to date him, and he loved that. He loved like being a character, and he was just so encouraging. He was like, you're a writer, just be a writer. I don't know, I really treasured that about him and about our time together. On Halloween 2011, he had a seizure at work and he was rushed to the hospital and we found out he had a brain tumor and they removed it and told us it was brain cancer. We got married on December 3rd of that year and we had a baby, Ralph. I had started a blog called myhusbandstumor.com. I just felt that was like the only thing that I could possibly contribute to his life and like his cancer treatment was just the documentation of it. Erin and I sensed that time was running out. We wanted Ralph to have a sibling. So we were at 11 weeks and six days and I had a miscarriage and I didn't think it was happening. I just told myself it wasn't happening. My dad died five days after that. And uh, Aaron died six weeks later. I wrote my first book in the six months after Aaron died. I wanted to document the immediacy of these losses and couldn't go and sit in my cubicle again and feel like a zoo animal who was like doing her best impression of living in like a natural habitat. There was no way that I could go and pretend like I was a normal person. Like I'm 100% not, um, not a normal person anymore. printing event at the Mall of America, one of my favorite places, one of Aaron's favorite places. Actually, one of our first dates was coming to Mall of America on Black Friday. I made like the best time. I was like, I think that you know if you should marry someone based on if you can go anywhere with them on Black Friday. Still Kickin' is a retail-based nonprofit that helps people get through the hard things in life. So we do that by providing financial grants and also true uh, emotional and community support to people that we call our Still Kickin' heroes. People who have experienced homelessness, mental illness, people who just need help. We are named Still Kickin' after Aaron's favorite t-shirt. He found this t-shirt at a thrift store and he loved it. And he happened to be wearing it the day that he had a seizure. That t-shirt meant a lot to him and it became 
really symbolic of everything that he was going through and that he went through for the next three years. And Still Kickin' as an organization is really Aaron's idea. He had wanted to like recreate this t-shirt, trace the t-shirt, reprint it, and give the money to people who needed it because medical emergencies decimate people emotionally, financially. So in two and a half years, we've been able to give over $85,000 to people who need it. After my book came out, I got so many messages from people all around the world who have gone through something really difficult. I knew that I had to do something with all of these stories, something that would help make it easier for people to talk about uh, the difficult things that are just a part of life. All right, I'm ready when you're ready. I'm Nora McInerney, and this is terrible. Thanks for asking. In case you've never had anyone in your life die, um, good for you. Also, just wait. And this is how it typically goes. Terrible Things for Asking is a podcast all about how people mask what they're feeling. I like to say that it's trying to get people to give honest responses to the question, how are you? Kat and Jim name their beautiful boy, James. From the beginning, James was in and out of the pediatric intensive care unit. He'd go from hospice to palliative care to hospice again. I think what makes Nora really good at what she does is the genuine kindness that she brings. And we're asking people for the most difficult things they've ever gone through and like the worst days of their life. And they're super happy to tell her in a way that I don't think they're happy to tell most people. At the beginning of this, Kat described trisomy 18 as incompatible with life. It is incompatible with the life we imagine that you could be 32 weeks pregnant and planning for a funeral while you hope for a birth. All of these struggles we go through, all these challenges, all these things that are very hard for us to talk about or acknowledge are really the things that make us a part of the world and the things that connect us. And all of my work is to try to bring these things into the light because people do want to be seen and heard through their hard things. Like people do want to talk about all these things that we assume people don't want to talk about. James's first birthday has passed. The girls had cake. They celebrated his extraordinary life, as short as it was, just like Kat promised they would, and just like they always will. Second book, I think the book is gonna be called No Happy Endings. It follows basically from Aaron's death through like basically the present day. I mean, after anything unpleasant happens to you, the minute that you have some sort of happiness again, people just sort of assume that like, she gets like a happy ending. It's like, well, it's not an ending and it's not just happy. It's actually really, really like emotionally complicated to experience happiness again when you've had anything traumatic happen to you. I knew Aaron would die. I knew that it was unlikely that at 31 I had had sex for the last time. I thought possibly I could con someone into loving me. I did not think that I would really feel a strong love again for another person. Like maybe just having a mediocre love. And I have another great love. I feel so lucky for that. I'm married again to a man named Matthew, and we have four children. They range from learning to walk to learning to drive. So we have like every stage of human life, basically in our house. It is intense, it is wonderful. All I ever wanted growing up was a huge family. Everything that I've lost is still a part of my life. It's still a part of me. And I have all of these things because I don't have Aaron. And that's like incredibly hard for me to reconcile and has been. I think it always will be. 